Are you still are you able to see the um, presentation? I can I can see the presentation. Okay, because it's I'm so used to using Google Meet because our district is a Google Meet district, so it's uh, it's new for me using Zoom. Not new. I mean, I've used it, but it's not I'm not as comfortable with it as I am Google Meet. I think I would feel the same way if you say Google. I'm like, what? yeah. <laughs> Well, Google Meet, like you can't see all the participants. You can only see like a certain number of them on the side when you're presenting your presentation, but you see uh -huh. your presentation beside the, pres the, the people. So it kind of like, I don't know, it just feels different. It's a different I don't know, feeling. <laughs> Okay, you let me know when you want me to um, have them come in. I still have them on hold until you're ready. Um, I'd say just right at 930. Um, Perfect. I'm going to give Derek a couple of more minutes to get in in case he comes. I don't know if he's going to come late or not. Um, so he if if he doesn't come in, um, I'm not going to be um, actively looking at the chat because we're going to be doing some activities throughout and having okay. some discussion. So if somebody asks a question in the chat that I need to address, feel free to stop me and let me did know. You what just want me to is. say you have, a, um, Ashley, you have a question or did you, um, you can, to... you can read it and, um, and I'll try to open the chat and take a look at it. Um, okay. but yesterday we, we didn't, I don't think there was a lot of questions in the chat. It's not, you know, super comprehensive what we're doing today or just best practices for having a discussion with kids. So um, I don't think there will be, but just in case he doesn't get here and, you know. If he, if he gets here after, like when you start, I'll send mm -hmm. you, uh, I'll send you a, a, a private message like he's here or something okay. to let you know. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I, I might not even it. see it, but he's oh, here. he's here. Okay. Derek, oh, yeah. Oh, my, he's here. He made it. You made it. Oh, you're home. You're not logged in. Yeah, I, got in I got in early, so I was like rushing home. To Yay. Home. Here. Just, sorry. Awesome. <laughs> so you didn't See, get to hear the panel this I did morning. It. How did it go? Oh, it went well I was, I was watching on on twitter i was seeing people's feedback and stuff when i was in the office but oh, people were enjoying it so yeah. i haven't checked the twitter yet <laughs> okay so it's 9 30 i'm gonna go ahead and start letting people in All and right, then um uh i'm sorry derek you're gonna be checking on the chat okay yep. we're good okay good luck guys thank you you're welcome Welcome. Howdy, howdy. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'd love to see your faces. So if you want to unmute um, your camera or turn on your camera, that'd be awesome. If you're not comfortable with that, that's okay, too. <laughs> Thanks for being. Hi, Sandra. You look like you're coming from uh, coming to us from your living room this morning. <laughs> I'm coming from my bedroom, my bedroom office. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, I'm actually in my living room. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, because you can see my the pictures of the kids back here. I have I've been doing a lot of changes in my house a lot, and so um, don't be shocked if you see my children's cats jump on me. <laughs> uh, they know when Nana is doing her school stuff. They like to be part of the, the show. And I'm like, uh, okay. Yeah, my cat is right behind me on the bed. He has a tendency to send a, jump up in my lap sometimes randomly. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for being here, everyone. I appreciate you guys coming. I mean, 
my session today was at the same time as Alice Keeler's session. So I was like, I don't know who's going to show up. <laughs> if I'm competing with Alice Keeler here. Everybody's going to go first. <laughs> but thanks for coming. Um, today, we are going to be using Pear Deck. So if you're just joining us, um, there is a code you can enter when you go to joinpd.com. The code is WBXNSP. Let me grab the link and I'll pop it into the chat. So that way it'll make it a little easier to access. Um, and Derek, if anybody else comes in, you can give them that link. So um, I'm Ashley. Thanks for being here today. Um, I am a a uh, coach in uh, Hemet Unified School District. I'm an educational technology coach and a CTI reflective coach. And I support teachers in our district with integrating technology um, into their classroom. And I work with mostly secondary ELA teachers because my background um, is in English language arts. I taught um, ELA for 11 years prior to stepping outside of the classroom for the last five years or so. Um, so Derek, um, He's with me today. Say hi, Derek. Yeah, hey, hey, I'm Derek Rao. Um, so I was a secondary math teacher for eight years. Um, and in the last few years, I've served as Hemet's ed tech administrator. So I work with Ashley and the team to um, integrate technology into the classroom. Yeah, so Derek is going to be helping me today by monitoring the chat and he'll lead you through a little activity kind of in the middle. Um, this is going to be an active participation training today. It's not going to be just to sit and get. So Hopefully you're comfortable participating and turning your cameras on today. Um, we're gonna be talking about how to engage our students in online um, synchronous academic discourse. And most of the ideas that I'm gonna be presenting today are not my own. They are the genius ideas from Catlin Tucker. If you, if you haven't um, familiarized yourself with her work, please do so, she is amazing. She has a new book coming out um, called UDL and blended learning. I think it just got, it's just been released, but I'm looking forward to reading that this year. So um, again, if you're just joining us, we're going to be using Pear Deck. Pear Deck is an add-on to Google Slides that allows um, your viewers or your audience to participate um, in your presentation live in real time. And so if you go to joinpd.com, and type in the code in the corner or click on the link that's in the chat. It will take you to the Pear Deck presentation. And I'm gonna to click to see how many people we've got logged in. I've seen nine of you connected to the presentation. So I'm gonna wait just a, another minute or so to, to, for you all to get connected. Um, and while you're getting connected, I wanna say that today's um, session is geared more towards secondary, however, the practices that we're gonna be discussing are just general best practices and you can modify these for lower grade levels if you are an elementary school teacher. So again, thanks for joining us. We're happy to be here with you today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. All right, so this is a, for you to try um, with Pear Deck today, if you've never used Pear Deck, this is a draggable slide. So there's some little icons at the bottom, those little flags. I'm gonna ask you to drag those onto the slide and where you're gonna drag them is onto this continuum of engagement. So thinking back this year, um, during your online classroom discussions, either when you were doing them whole group with your students or when you were doing them in breakout rooms, where do you think that most of your students were on this continuum of engagement? Um, this continuum came from the distance learning playbook, which one of our panelists actually mentioned this morning. Our district also um, got that uh, playbook from Fisher, Frey, and Hattie. Um, and it's an image that kind of uh, just talks about the different levels of engagement being from active to passive on both ends of the scale of disengagement or engagement. So were your students disrupting, um, distracting other people? Were they avoiding the discussion, looking for ways to avoid the work or engaging in off-task behavior? Were they withdrawing and just kind of not really engaged in what you were doing? Or were they more on the engagement side, participating, paying attention, responding to your questions, or even deeper into that engagement, investing, asking questions? You could see they, they were valuing what they were learning. Or were they driving, 
during that engagement process, let setting their goals, seeking feedback, engaging in self-assessment. So I'm going to show the responses to see where I, where you all put your flags. And it's really awesome to see that most of your, your students were in, on that engagement side. Um, hopefully not too many on the disrupting side, because we know that can be a headache. Um, but yeah, so if they're participating, we want to um, get them more into that investing and driving area of engagement. So we're going to talk today uh, about how to do that. Um, so that was our first little temperature check right there. Um, the second question I want you to respond to is, okay, so they were engaged. What strategies have you been using to get your students talking? during academic discussions in those live synchronous virtual um, sessions. So you should be uh, seeing a box on the side of your screen. Um, and again, you should have two tabs open. You should have your Zoom tab open where you can see what I'm presenting. Um, and then you have a second tab with your Pear Deck and um, where you can actually type into. So go ahead and type some strategies. Think for a second. Um, when you got those kids talking, how did you do it? How did you get the kids talking? What strategies? And I'm going to show your responses. It's anonymous. It's not going to show your name. Um, I see someone typing polls and Jamboard. See what else we got going on here. Polls, Jamboard, weekly check-in. Questions. You asked critical questions. Games, yes. I'll give you a couple more minutes to type some responses in there. Boom cards. I haven't heard of that strategy. Um, whoever typed that, would you be willing to unmute and tell us about boom cards? you're not comfortable yet, that's okay. Or you can type in the chat or elaborate here. Boom cards, I don't know what that is. Use of games such as Kahoot polls and asking relevant questions. Okay, so I see some good strategies. I'm a little curious more about the boom card strategy. Okay, so let's talk about um, some more uh, things that we can do. Um, and I'm gonna give you lots of ideas, Nearpod. And I see, I think someone's typing Khan Academy or maybe Kahoot at the bottom. Thank you for your responses. Okay, so how many of you, if you can either give me a thumbs up um, by pushing the little thumbs up button or um, turn your camera on and give me a visual thumbs up. How many of you are familiar with the work of John Hattie? I see a couple of thumbs. Okay, so John Hattie um, did a ton of research where he, re he studied factors that influence and accelerate or decelerate learning with our students. Factors like um, things they experience at home, various teaching strategies, uh, types of curriculum, technology. He, he studied 277 factors over, I'm not even sure how long, 15 years, 20 years or so. Um, if you click this image on the right hand side of your screen, it will take you to his global research database, which categorizes and identifies each factor's effect size, which basically means that um, this particular factor has an, a, the potential to influence student achievement. And what he found in his research is that 4.0 or 0 0.40 is the hinge point on his barometer of influence, which means that factor that has an effect size of 0 0.40 or higher, it's going to have greater impact on student learning. So you can see all of the factors on his database and you'll notice that classroom discussions are in there. Those have a 0.82 effect size, which means they have the potential 
to considerably accelerate student learning. And the reason why potential is italicized here is because if we're not doing these discussions in um, the correct way, I guess, it's not going to have any impact at all. So we need to make sure that when we're engaging students in classroom discussions that we're doing it in a strategic and meaningful way. And if we do that, it could drastically increase your students' learning. So um, I'm gonna reference his global research database a couple times throughout this presentation. So if you wanna keep that tab open, you can look back at, at it. Um, you could actually spend hours looking through that database. There's lots of good stuff there. Okay, so this is the question that all every online teacher in the world is asking. How can I increase engagement and participation in my synchronous online discussions? How can I make them more meaningful? How can I make them more impactful? These are questions, and that's probably why you're here today is because you want to know the answer to these questions. Um, so let's talk first about why students may not be wanting to participate in your discussions or why they may be hesitant. Um, so we need to understand that um, engaging in online discussions for our students can feel scary and intimidating. Um, they might be dealing with shyness or insecurity or trying to overcome anxiety that they're dealing with. Other possible reasons, um, they might be confused about the task or the expectations or the protocols, or they may just be thinking about what they want to say and they might not be quite ready to respond yet. I know for me, I am a processor and it takes me time to think about what I'm gonna say before I say it. So if you spring a question on me, like I might look at you like a deer in headlights for a second because it's gonna take me a minute. But if um, you know the students feel prepared to have a discussion, then they're gonna be more likely to respond and more comfortable responding. So a uh, Catlin Tucker says, participating in real-time discussion is scary and feels risky for some of our students. So what we need to do is help them sort of overcome that fear. So our job, she says, is to help students find their voices and develop the confidence and their ability to articulate their ideas. Um, I remember being um, in college and having to take uh, speech and debate classes and feeling major anxiety before having to do those things. And so helping them realize that when they're participating in these discussions, it's gonna help them overcome those fears later on in their life is important. So I've included a, a, a resource on this slide from Edutopia. They published this back in the fall. Um, SEL strategies for students uh, to turn their cameras on. So if you're having trouble getting your kiddos to turn their cameras on, these are some strategies that you can explore to get them to help with that. But our district did not require students to have their cameras on because we don't know what's going on in the background of their home. Um, we don't know, you know, they might be living in utter chaos and they might not feel comfortable turning that camera on. So I would say not to force anyone to turn their camera on, but encourage them to. I know one of our teachers referred to her students in the um, in the online world as her fishies. And she would say, oh, there's my fishies in my fishbowl. Can you guys come out and show me that you're swimming around today? And she would, she sort of used that that verbiage to get her students to turn their cameras on. I think she, Sandra's shaking her head because she knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so um, one other thing I wanna mention, how many of you are familiar with Kate Kinsella? The work of Kate Kinsella, English 3D, give me a thumbs up if you, heard of Kate Kinsella or you know her work. I know in our district, um, our ELs use that curriculum, the, our, our newcomers. So she says, and this was like relevatory to me when I heard her say this in a training, if they can't say it, they can't write it. So think about that. If your students can't say it, if they can't articulate it, then they're not going to be able to put that down in writing. So we want to encourage them to develop that voice develop those speaking skills so that they, they can become, become better speakers and writers. So articulating the why, this is a huge, what's the value of online academic discourse or just academic uh, discourse in general, even if we're not online, um, our students need to understand why are we doing this anyway? What is the point? Why are you making me talk in front of my peers? Why, like what is the value? 
And so it's important for us to help them see the why, give them the reason. So here are some reasons you could give to your students. We're doing this discussion because we wanna build our learning community. We're having this discussion because we wanna drive our thinking deeper. We're better collectively than we are individually. So we're gonna put our brains together and we're gonna drive our thinking deeper. Um, you might tell them, hey, we're having this discussion because it's gonna help you remember this information. So when I test you on it later, you're gonna ace it. So it's gonna improve the retention of that information. Um, also, these discussions are for you as the teacher because it's gonna provide some insight to you about your, where your students are at and help you determine what next steps you need to take because you're gonna be listening to what they're saying and realizing where there's some misunderstandings or misconceptions that you might need to address. So again, quote, when students see a connection between academic tasks and their own future goals, they're more likely to extend persistent effort and exhibit academic behaviors that support school success. So again, don't um, underestimate the value of articulating the why. Why are we even having these discussions? Okay, so we're gonna do a little breakout room right now. Maria, our moderator is going to split you up into breakout rooms. And what I'm gonna ask you to do inside your breakout room is speak to this question. So the question is, what might you say to students to communicate the value of having academic discussions? So how are you gonna communicate to students the value of having academic discussions? I want you to think about your answer to that question. And when you have a, a thought in your head and you, you know what you're gonna say in your breakout room, I want you to move that red thumbs up to the blue circle. So think about it. And when you're ready, move your thumbs up to the blue circle. Okay, are we ready? Not quite yet. I'm going to give okay. them a little bit more direction. Okay, so once you're inside your breakout room, you're going to find out, talk to each other, find out who is the most veteran teacher in the room, who's been teaching the longest, and the person who is the veteran is going to share their response first. So veteran teachers, share your response and your insights on how you communicate to students the value of having academic discussions. After you share, once everybody shares, the veteran in the room is going to choose a member of the group to share out with the whole group when we come back. So be ready to, if you're chosen, be ready to share your response when we come back from the breakout rooms. So before Maria splits us into breakout rooms, is there anybody that has a clarifying question or any confusion? about the process. Okay, I think we're good to go, Maria. Okay, here we go.
Did, did you guys not, were you not able to go in the break room sessions? Oh, the roll. Roll from my yard. It doesn't. Cover. Yeah, we have a uh, fifteen people in the room. So fifteen people staying. <laughs> why is she not? Why are they not joining? I was like, June, I thought my day was eventful yesterday. <laughs>
Maria, are you there? I'm here. Did um, I kick you I, guys out? No, you can go ahead. I was I hit the close room button. Um, so we can go ahead and close the rest of the rooms and okay. bring everybody back. Thank they're, you. They're slowly but surely coming back. Slowly but surely coming back yeah. to us. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had um, some rich discussion in your breakout rooms. We're coming back. I think we're waiting on maybe one more room. Nope, nope we're all here. Okay, so um, nope, nope, we're waiting. <laughs> Still waiting. They're coming back. Welcome back. All right, so um, the question that was posed in your room was, what might you say to students to communicate the value of having academic discussions. Why are we having these discussions anyway? What is the point? Why do you need us to talk? Like, what's the point? So what were the ideas that were shared? I'm, I'm gonna call on um, Regina first because she was in my room. Um, Regina, if you wanna unmute and um, share um, what was shared in your room. Sure. In our room. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, there, there were several very important things that were shared there. Uh, first of all, to help the students uh, with their academics discussion, uh, it was mentioned that making connections to the future, uh, how to be able to discuss different topics was important. Another point was the ability to get up from failure, you know, um, that in, in my personal case, I put myself out there. I gave um, extra points for any student that would ca catch me making a, a, a mistakes it, during the lesson. And that helped them build their confidence and, and participate more in the lessons. Another point that was also mentioned was the respect that we have to have for each other in listening to different points of views and we may not agree with what uh, is being said, but we have to be able to respect what is being said. And basically, I think those were the more important things that were discussed in our in our group. Absolutely, and and I would um, guess that there were probably some similar ideas shared. Did any of the groups have something different that was shared that we could share out whole group for the good of the group, a brave soul? Feel free to unmute. Well, I think one thing that came out uh, slightly different is, is that ability to, or opportunity to develop empathy uh, for others. And especially when you get those uh, additional perspectives, so. so. Yes, that is critical. Um, these discussions allow us the opportunity to see other perspectives and build empathy. I love that. Um, so for sake of time, we are gonna uh, wrap it up and go on. Um, so we've communicated to our students or we're communicating our, to our students the, the value of the discussions first and foremost, but then we need to think about logistics. When we're actually having a discussion, the three steps um, to making sure our discussions are effective and intentional. And so I'm gonna share with you Catlin Tucker's three-step process for con effectively conducting online academic discourse with students. And these same three steps can be used face-to-face -face instruction as well. This is not just online. Um, and at the end of this, the, today's session, I'm gonna ask you what these three steps are. So the three steps are prepare, facilitate, and wrap up prepare, facilitate, wrap up. We're gonna briefly talk about each of these uh, stages. So first one, prepare. We all know it is critical to plan and prepare for what we're gonna be doing in the classroom with students. So Catlin Tucker shares two things we should do. First, create and share a planning document. And then secondly, prepare presentation slides in advance of the conversation. So. First thing, let's talk about the planning document. This slide has some clickable links. If you click on the image under planning document, that's Catlin Tucker's planning document. If you click on it, it will prompt you to make a copy. 
I've also made one at the bottom that's a little bit more colorful. So she says, in your planning document, include your behavior and participation expectations. So students know ahead of time what they are expected to do and how they are expected to behave. Include discussion strategies or sentence starters and the discussion questions themselves to help students prepare to respond respectfully and contribute to the discussion. So this morning, if you were present at the 8.30 panel session, you saw that myself and several other people were part of a panel discussion. Those questions were not just given to us off the cuff. Dennis sent us the questions ahead of time so we could prepare to have thoughtful responses to those questions. Why don't we do the same thing for our students? I mean, how, how many times I can think back to past my own past teaching experience where I've come to have a discussion with my students about a novel and I'm just like winging it. Like I'm not even thinking ahead of time about what questions I'm gonna ask, I'm just winging it. So we need to actually think ahead of time, what are the questions that I'm going to be asking my students? She says they should be thought provoking, high interest questions planned in advance and so important. So I'm gonna click on um, the one that I did. I like color, I don't, it just helps me visually see things better, I like color. So I made a colored um, um, planning template, but again, those behavior expectations, outline what your discussion questions are and give space for students to prepare their response. And then also have them, remind them of what you want them to come to the discussion prepared with. So do you want them to have questions ready to pose to other students? Do you want them to bring a specific resource or material with them to the discussion? So that's also important as well. Ashley, would you mind um, grabbing that link real fast and posting that in? That one is not linked into the in the uh, slides for some reason. Oh, sure. Thank you. Let me change. Oh, there it is. It's restricted. Let me change that. Here we go. Sorry for the delay. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Okay. So second thing, presentation slides. Um, this image in the middle is Catlin Tucker's presentation slides. And you're going to notice that her slides are very simple, basic, black and white, boom, discussion question, one on a slide, eliminates all the distractions and just zones students' attention in right on the question. I, I like that for students who um, may be distracted by color and images and gifts and all that stuff. But if you like to have a little bit more animation, you can always design your own. And I've included a link to some free slide templates. So again, first step in getting ready to have a discussion is to make sure that you prepare for the discussion. Um, second step is facilitate. So when you're having the discussion, it's important that you're using facilitation skills to keep the conversation moving, but keeping students' contributions and ideas at the forefront of the discussion. Oftentimes, we as teachers, we love to hear ourselves talk. It's just the trait that we naturally have. I don't know why, but we have to sometimes make ourselves be quiet and let their ideas come out. So um, steps to do this, best practices for facilitating before the discussions. Again, again, remind the students of your norms and expectations. You can refer to the planning document that you gave them, remind them of the protocols you're expecting. Um, and then when you get ready to start the discussion, project one question at a time, give students some processing time, a minute to read the question and think about how they were gonna answer. We just did that a second ago when I asked you to move that thumb to the blue dot. I gave you a little bit of processing time to think about your answer. Um, allow students to brainstorm ideas in the chat window you can do this, this is sort of optional, but it does allow this more processing time for students who may need a little bit more think time. There's a couple of strategies, you, I've heard it called waterfall, where you just type in your response and then when the teacher says waterfall, everybody hits enter and the, the answers just kind of flood in the chat. Or we have heard it called chat explosion. Either way, whatever strategy you like to use um, is fine. And then the last piece is selecting a student to start off the discussion. Um, I earlier modeled this when I selected Regina from my group and I told you all, 
you're going to choose the veteran gets to choose who's going to go. So that eliminates some confusion as a time saver if you select that student. So Derek's going to model this um, process for us right now. All righty, and we will do a waterfall with the following topic. So do not uh, push send, but if you wouldn't mind, I'll give you, I've got a timer on my phone. I'll give you a minute just to think about this, your response to this question and to actually type that out in the chat. And then we'll all push send together. Um, and then we'll see a waterfall of responses and um, take the discussion from there. So you will be responding to how do you usually select a student to start it off a discussion. So what's your modus operandi? What's your typical um, process for selecting students to kick off a discussion? So you, uh, give yourself one minute to think about that and then respond in the chat, but don't push submit yet. That's very important. We'll, we'll do that together. All right, so about five more seconds and we will push enter in three, two, one, now. <clears throat> so as you can see, it's a pretty engaging, when you, when you look at the chat and you just see all the ideas flood, um, depending upon the size of the room, it can be really pr pronounced or, or it could just be a few, um, but this is a really great way to just elicit responses from students, give them plenty of think time um, to, to build an answer. Everyone is sharing at once so every student contributes. Um, I'll share a little anecdote because Dr. Magana uh, recommended I do so earlier in our breakout room. I shared um, that about a month ago I was driving to work and heard a um, doctor being uh, interviewed on NPR and they were interviewing him about the how hard it is to get vaccine reluctant populations to take the vaccine and to reduce the COVID transmission rates. And he made a point that just like resonated immediately with me. Um, in an educational concept, concept context, but um, it's probably a cliche in the medical world, but he said, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. And the point of that, I thought about that a little bit, it's like, gosh, that's really profound because all of the genius and the scientific breakthroughs and the collaboration and the individual contribu contributions actually mean nothing if that vial just sits on a shelf or sits in a refrigerator. So I think about, I think about you know, the value of a vaccine is when you actually jab it in someone's arm and the value of discourse is when it comes out of students, right? The knowledge and ideas are actually meaningless. I'm not, I mean, for our internal learning maybe, but in terms of a classroom discussion, if it just sits in a shelf in our own minds, um, and this, is, this technique is one way to make sure that that gets out there. So um, I, I, love, I love a lot of these answers. Um, Actually, I choose a student who is engaged. I like that. A lot of times I think teachers choose students who are not engaged almost as a punishment, but choosing someone who is engaged in the conversation and might have something to contribute, that could be generative to conversations later on. Um, selecting a student randomly, but always giving thinking time, Karen. I like this response. Sometimes I select a student I think can help guide the others due to expertise or skills to model. Um, Karen, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and just uh, giving a few more words to that. I really liked that response about um, knowing your students and their expertise or skill levels to, to be a model for that discussion. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I know, I know that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, very often there are some shy students, um, as Amber mentioned earlier today, and they may have really great ideas. So they might need some extra thinking time so they can formulate their ideas. I think Ashley also shared that today. Um, and then as far as the students who have some expertise or skills to model, sometimes you already know that a student already is really well, um, understands the topic, understands the directions. There's no real confusion there and they can really guide the other students in their conversation. 
And um, I think that can be extremely effective in their learning because they're so tired of listening to an adult in the room speak all the time. So yeah. um, that's what I do. Yeah, I love it. Very yeah. insightful. I, I, I saw Dr. Hickman said, um, ask for volunteers so as to not embarrass anybody. I wish I had read that response before, uh, just calling you out and embarrassing me. <laughs> I really <appreciate laughs> that response, but Ashley, you can take it away. Well, yeah, so if, if you're not keen on just, you know, if, if it's the expectation that, hey, I'm going to be selecting someone at random, like the students know that's, that's the expectation. So random name selectors like Wheel of Names is a, a popular one. You can just plug in your, you know, list of students' names and it just randomly spins and boom, you select their name. And then that way there's no, why do you always pick me um, attitude coming from the kids? So that's a good uh, strategy to use that random name. And then making that a part of the norm in your classroom is that it's going to be random. Um, okay, so we just kind of modeled some of those facilitation strategies right now. So identifying moments of disagreement and agreement with your students, um, helping them make connections between shared ideas, asking follow-up questions like Derek just did with Karen to get students to dive deeper into their thoughts, um, inviting quiet students into the conversation, as Derek mentioned that with the vaccine analogy, it, if it's saying in their brain, then it, there's no value to the conversation. So we want to get those ideas out and um, inviting them in to have that conversation. Um, recognizing someone said uh, the students who are really engaged or maybe who have something really valuable to say, you just see it right there and, and, and you know that they're going to bring something awesome. So recognizing those strong contributions and guiding students towards meaning making and inquiry. These are all strategies from um, Catlin Tucker. Uh, for best practices when you're facilitating a discussion. So the last step of the process is wrapping it up. So Catlin suggests two things. One, engaging students in a post-discussion reflection. And then two, asking them to assess their own engagements and their own participation in the discussion. So she says reflective activities encourage students to reflect on what they've learned as a result of participating in the classroom discussion. Um, this is a template um, that you can steal from this presentation. You're gonna be getting the bit.ly to the presentation at the end, um, but you could take this slide. Um, this three, two, one is an avid strategy. Um, have them list three details, facts, or concepts they are taking away from the discussion. Have them ask a couple of questions that they still have. And then something that was surprising, they could write a sentence about. So you can change up the prompts as needed, but you could put this slide as an individual slide for students to respond to, or put like several copies of the slide in one deck so that, that students can see each other's reflections. It depends on, again, the purpose of your um, activity there. Um, additional reflection tools. I asked you at the forefront what tools and strategies you were using to get your students engaged in discussion. It doesn't always have to be um, them speaking verbally. We want the thoughts out of their minds. And sometimes that means they may just need to type it out. So putting it in a Padlet or a Google form, again, depending if you want the reflection to be more private or more public, Padlet allows them to interact with each other, whereas that Google form is just going to come straight to you. Um, Flipgrid, it, it, I'm going to give you a little bonus information about Flipgrid, but if you haven't seen the recent updates to Flipgrid, students can now not only record their own videos, but they can type text responses to each other. So if you want them to react to each other's thoughts and have that digital discussion, Flipgrid is a great platform for that. Um, Mentimeter, if that's a quick sort of poll um, that, uh, application that they can use to give you a quick reflective response. Um, and again, you can either share the, the responses whole group or just keep it private to yourself to see how they reflected. But getting them to reflect on that discussion and their learnings and their takeaways is huge. And then the last piece is the self-assessment. Encourage students to take responsibility for their participation in the discussion. If you look at Hattie's global list that we talked about at the top of this presentation, self-judgment and reflection is a 0.75 effect size. So once students start taking ownership of their learning and reflecting on it and assessing themselves, their learning accelerates. So that's huge. Get them to do that. And some ways you can do that, Google form um, exit ticket. If you click that link right there, um, it will take you to Catlin Tucker's 
Google form that um, you can make a copy of and you can change it up however you need. But there's four things that she suggests. One is have students evaluate their own engagement in the conversation, describe their level of preparedness. So when they're coming to the table, did they prepare? Were they ready for this um, conversation? Have them identify what they did well and what they need to work on, and then set goals that they can work towards for future discussions. All right, so I'm gonna have you do a quick reflection. We have like a minute left, so I'm probably not gonna give you a whole lot of time for this, but what are those three steps to effectively conducting an um, academic discourse with students and any questions you still have and one little takeaway from today's session. So go ahead and fill that out on the pair deck and I'm gonna show responses. We've got that prepare, facilitate and wrap up. Those are your three steps. And I said this in yesterday's session, but those three steps, they're so simple, it's stupid, right? Like that's common sense. We need to prepare for the discussion, we're gonna facilitate it and then we're gonna wrap it up. But just remembering to do that, um, don't just wing those discussions, make sure that you're actually preparing for it, that you're facilitating it in a thoughtful and engaging way, and that you're allowing students time to reflect and assess their own participation in that discussion. Um, all right, so I see that you're still typing there. Um, questions was, was part two. What questions do you still have? And I may not be able to answer those right now. Um, if I can, I will respond um, to you via email if, if it's something super important. All right. Um, and while you're finishing that up, I'm gonna wrap us up here. I'm gonna leave that slide open so that you can still respond. Um, I've included a bonus slide in this presentation for Flipgrid, um, more information about how to use that to have those digital um, discussions. And then um, at the end, don't forget to go back to SCED and provide us some feedback on today's session. I know we're running a little late, but thank you for being here. Um, I want you to take a minute, I'm gonna flip to the next slide move the blue dot, how engaged were you in today's training? And again, this is your own self-assessment for your own participation in today's discussions. We've got a lot of engagement. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that you all are here and that you were engaged in participating with me today. All right, there's that bonus slide. And um, this is our, our thank you and our contact information. If you have additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Again, thank you for being here. I know you had to choose between some other great sessions today and Alice Keeler's session, but I, pre I appreciate you being here and learning with us today. And feel free to reach out if you have questions. Derek, if you wanna pop the bit.ly into the chat or you can click on it from the pair deck either way Sandra you're yeah, I popped it in a little bit ago oh Ashley this is actually my son's cat I, I don't own the cats I'm just Nana so this is the baby of the family yeah so cute <laughs>